Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books are sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This Day in Sports History. And welcome back to This Day in Sports History, a member of the Sports History Podcast Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sports. Learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It's June 22nd, and on this day in 1938, it was a heavyweight boxing title fight. And yet, it was so much more than that. This was American Joe Lewis versus German Max Schmeling, the rematch. The two had met a little over two years prior on June 19, 1936. In that fight, the veteran Schmeling had beaten the previously unbeaten and favored 22-year-old Lewis with a 12th round knockout. The poet Langston Hughes had been ringside at that fight and lamented seeing people crying on the streets of New York when they learned Joe Lewis had been knocked out. In Germany, it had been a euphoric celebration of Adolf Hitler's Aryan superiority as the white German had defeated the black American. Schmeling had been flown back to Germany aboard the Hindenburg and feted by Hitler and the Nazi party. Joe Lewis went back to work. On this day in 1937, Lewis beat the Cinderella man James J. Braddock to become the heavyweight champion of the world. That win put Lewis back on a collision course with Schmeling exactly one year later. Lewis said that he would never consider himself the champion unless and until he beat Schmeling. Two years earlier, rumors swirled that Lewis had not prepared hard enough, hadn't trained sufficiently for the first bout with Schmeling. With two more years of maturity and experience, along with the memory of the beating he had taken in the first fight, Lewis was determined not to take anything for granted. He entered the ring that night at a sold-out Yankee Stadium in the best condition of his life, and with a winning strategy, he knew Schmeling liked to feel out his opponent in the early rounds, figure out their strategy, and then take advantage. Lewis vowed not to give him that chance to figure out anything, When the bell rang for round one, Schmeling was dancing, Lewis was charging. He threw punches immediately and relentlessly. Left, right, uppercut, jab, body blows, headshots, repeat. And not only was he throwing them, his punches were connecting and causing damage. In one barrage, he broke a vertebrae in Schmeling's back. Lewis put him on the mat. Schmeling got back up. Lewis pounded him again with a vicious combination. Schmeling went back down again. He got to his feet again, only to be met with more of the same. Right to the body, a left hook to the jaw, and Schmeling is down. The count is five, five, six, seven, eight. The men are in the ring. The fight is over on a technical knockout. Max Schmeling is beaten in one round. Three time, two minutes, four seconds, first round, referee stops it. A first round knockout and a message sent across the Atlantic. Schmeling spent the next 10 days in a New York City hospital. After he returned to Germany, he spent an additional six weeks recovering in a hospital there. Joe Lewis became a hero, not just to black Americans, he was already that, but to all Americans. For a brief moment, he transcended racial bigotry in the country to unify all around the growing concern in Europe. Lewis paused his boxing career in 1942 to enlist in the Army, and when he died in 1981, Ronald Reagan requested Joe Lewis be buried at Arlington National Cemetery and honored as a true American hero. Okay, before moving on, just a quick note about the rest of the episode today. This is a day that is packed with so many good stories. It's hard to know where to go next and how many to do, so I'm going to pare down the stories a little bit and do more nugget-sized bites than whole sandwiches and combo platters. 
So moving to 1994, and on this day, it was a World Cup win for the ages for the U.S., but it led to the demise of one player in particular. This was the U.S. versus Colombia, with the Colombians heavily favored. So soccer is huge in the U.S. now, but back in the mid-90s, eh, not many Americans cared much about it, despite the fact that the U.S. was hosting the friggin' World Cup for the first time. In Colombia, soccer was life, a religion, a source of pride when their team won, a boiling cauldron of hate when they lost. The pivotal moment of this match came in the 35th minute when John Harkes crossed a ball into the 18 to a streaking Ernie Stewart. Colombian defender Andres Escobar slid to get a foot on the pass to redirect it away from Stewart. Instead, Escobar redirected it into his own goal. The Americans stayed on the attack, and in the 52nd minute, Tab Ramos played a beautiful through ball to Stewart, and he chipped it over the goalkeeper to make it 2-0. The Colombians scored late to make it a 2-1 final, but the U.S. advanced to the knockout round. The Colombians were headed home disappointed. But unfortunately, that's not where this story ends. Escobar was obviously dejected after his own goal and the loss to the U.S., he was heckled and jeered relentlessly when he returned to Colombia. On July 2nd, he was murdered in Medellin by a soccer hooligan. The man in a gang of three shot Escobar six times, screaming goal after each shot was fired, upset about Escobar's own goal in the World Cup on this day in 1994. On this day in 1986, it was a goal that lives in soccer lore, but it shouldn't have counted then and would easily be overturned with the technology of today. It was Maradona's Hand of God goal. Now, if you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but to set the scene, it's the World Cup hosted by Mexico that year. This was a quarterfinal match between Argentina and England. In the 52nd minute of a scoreless game, Maradona sent a pass to his teammate Jorge Valdano at the top of the 18, who misplayed it a bit, and he popped it up for England's Steve Hodge, who sent it in an arc towards his goalkeeper, Peter Shilton. Maradona continued his run, and because of the touch by Hodge, negated any offside call. He jumped with Shilton in an apparent attempt at a header, but instead pushed it into the goal with his hand. England immediately pleaded for handball, but referee Ali Benansour did not see it nor did the assistant referee, and the goal stood. In today's era of VAR, that goal would have been overturned in a matter of seconds, and the game would have remained scoreless. Maradona scored a legitimate and absolutely gorgeous goal later, and Argentina, aided by the hand of God, won 2-1. At the time, Maradona insisted it was a legitimate header goal, but 20 years later, and after photo evidence showed his hand redirecting the ball, he finally admitted that he indeed had used his hand. To baseball now, and if you remember the June 15th edition of this dish, I talked about Cincinnati's Johnny Vandermeer doing something that no one else in the history of baseball has ever done or equaled. Well, on this day in 1947, it was the closest anyone has ever come to actually matching it. So to recap, in 1938, Vandermeer pitched consecutive no-hitters, his second coming against the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, nine years later, his teammate Yule Blackwell came within an eyelash of joining him on that exclusive list. Blackwell was a six-foot, six-inch intimidator on the mound, known as the whip for his sidearm delivery. With one out in the ninth inning, he had not allowed a hit for the second straight game. He needed just two more outs, but Eddie Stanky ended his bid with a single in the ninth. Jackie Robinson followed him with another. Blackwell settled down and got the final two outs for the complete game and a 4 0 win, but missed his opportunity to become the second to pitch consecutive no hitters. And hitting the links now, several great stories to shrink wrap. On this day in 2009, it was Lucas Glover sinking a three-foot par putt to win the U.S. Open by two shots at Beth Page Black. It was only his second win on the PGA Tour, and he had to play a qualifier just to make the field. This was a weather-marred U.S. Open. No round started and finished on the same day in a true slogfest. 
In 2014, Michelle Wee won the U.S. Women's Open at Pinehurst. She shot a final round 70 to win by two shots, but nearly coughed it up on the 16th hole after making double bogey. She put the wheels back on the bus, birdieing 17 and parring 18 to win her first and still only major of her career. Also in 2014, on the PGA Tour that week, Kevin Streelman set a PGA record by birdieing seven consecutive holes to win the Travelers' Championships. But not just any seven, he birdied the final seven holes to charge up the leaderboard and beat K.J. Choi and Sergio Garcia by a shot. He shot 28 on the backside and one putt every green on the closing nine. His seven straight birdies en route to a win topped the record set by Mike Suchak in 1956. Now, I say en route to a win because the PGA Tour record for consecutive birdies made is nine by Mark Kalkovecchia as part of his second round in the 2009 Canadian Open. But Kalkovecchia did not hoist the winner's trophy on Sunday of that tournament. And time now for today's non-sports did you know. On this date in 1918, four people were arrested and over 100 waiters taken into custody over the apparent widespread practice of waiters poisoning customers in Chicago. Guests who tipped poorly were given Mickey Finn powder in their food or drinks that was intended to cause dizziness, headaches, and even vomiting. That's all for today. Thanks for stopping by and giving this episode a listen. This Day in Sports History is a member of the Sports History Podcast Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sports. Learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. This has been an original Thrive Sweet production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned... We're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at Sports. HistoryNetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to SportsHistoryNetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.